we'll spend the next few minutes talking about flow rate in a fluid. So the flow rate, which is shown in your book as a capital Q, is defined to be the volume of fluid passing by some point or through some location during a given period of time. So the flow rate is volume over time. Volume, capital V here again, showing the little serifs on the top to remind you it's a capital V representing volume and not a lowercase v showing velocity. The volume over time, so looking at this simple example on the right here of fluid traveling through a circular tube. So we look at some little bit of that fluid. So this entire thing is covered in fluid. But we're going to look at the fluid between these two points, D, having area A. So this cylinder of fluid, this volume of fluid, is moving to the right at velocity V. Well, Q, the flow rate, is the volume over time. Well, for a cylinder, volume is the area of one end of the cylinder times the length of the cylinder, in this case, D. So volume is A times D. Well, D is changing with time, right? The area is not. The tube size isn't changing. So I can pull off that A. D over time, how fast the fluid is moving with respect to time, is the average velocity. So the flow rate can be defined as volume over time, or the area, the cross-sectional area of a fluid times its average velocity. And again, see how Vs are in two places in this equation? This V with the serifs on represents uh, volume. This V sans the serifs, right? Without the little things on top, that lowercase V is velocity. Well, what does this flow rate equation give us? Well, when you're pushing water through a tube, as in this example here, the flow rate has to remain constant. The amount of volume that's passing you through some time for a given flow rate remains constant throughout the entire tube. It can't increase as you move down through the tube because that would create a vacuum as the water on one end of the tube moves faster than the water coming into that point. That doesn't make sense. Or if the water leaving a point is slower than the water coming to a point, as long as the tube remains the same, that means water will build up in the middle. That doesn't make sense either. So the volume flow rate has to remain the same for a given closed system. So what happens if you take a large tube, like the one we have over here, and narrow it down into a smaller opening? Well, the volume flow rate has to remain the same. So this volume of fluid I have drawn over on the left and the volume of fluid I have drawn on the right is the same volume. The area times the average speed over here in section one, the fat end of the tube, must equal the volume flow rate or the area times the average speed on the right end of the tube. The only way that's possible, it's very clear that A2, this cross-sectional area here, is much smaller than the cross-sectional area on the left. And the only way the volume flow rate can be maintained is if V2 is much larger than V1 for this equation to balance. And many of you might have experienced this if you've ever used a garden hose that doesn't have a sprayer at the end, it's just water coming out of a hose. One way to spray further is to put your thumb over the end of the hose. That restricts the area where the water can move and the water spits out faster with a faster speed. Or if you have one of those adjustable shower heads. If you take off your shower head, water just pours out of the spout at a pretty slow pace. But if you put on one of those adjustable shower heads and you have very, very small pinholes in that shower head, you can actually get a very high velocity stream of water coming out of those small pinholes. So as the tube gets narrower, the velocity of the fluid increases. This happens with rivers as well. If you've ever been tubing on a river, you know that, or uh, canoeing or kayaking or whatever, as the river narrows, the speed of the river increases. And then as the river gets wide, the speed decreases of the current flow. 